Hi, my name's Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the Forest River RPOD 178 today. We're going to start right up front here with the coupling and uncoupling procedure. Uh, what we have right up front here is a latch style coupler. Uh, as it sits, this would be the unlocked position. This is going to be your starting position when it does come to loading the unit. Uh, you are going to raise this three inches above your ball. Uh, we're then going to center your ball and drop underneath the coupler here. Uh, then we're going to go down with that jack and uh, lower it down on top of the ball. Now once it is fully seated on the ball, we can go ahead and slide this back into that locked position. When we do go ahead and lock that back, we do want to go, go ahead and uh, give it a tug here in the upward uh, direction. That way we can make sure that it is fully locked on. Of course, ultimately what we're looking for is that this uh, secondary latch is in fact uh, truly engaged and locked on there at the coupler. Now here you'll see a small hole that's designed for a security pin, whether that's going to be a locking pin or just like a spring pin. Uh, it's going to not only add, you, add uh, a, a, a secondary safety to the coupler, but it also can be used as a security feature, uh, allowing people to not, uh, you know, locking this uh, down. Uh, so from there, we're going to go ahead and run the jack all the way up into the fully up position. All of our weight at that point is going to be on the ball uh, and essentially the uh, receiver of the vehicle. From there, we're going to go ahead and we are going to take your tow chains and let me unwrap this breakaway here. So we're going to then take your tow chains and we are going to cross those underneath the coupler. So it is state law in Texas that these chains not only need to be crossed underneath the coupler, but they are, it is also illegal for them to make contact with the payment at any given time. So uh, skate that line of uh, having enough room to make your turns left or right, but not so much room that these are going to drag on the ground. Uh, so with those crossed underneath the coupler, we then only have your emergency breakaway to hook up. So uh, this emergency breakaway is essentially your last safety feature when it does come to, uh, you know, this coupling and uncoupling. What it is designed to do is if your coupler here were to fail and your tow chains were to fail, as the two vehicles separated, this is going to act like a ripcord to the electric brakes, pulling that pin back there, uh, putting full 12 volts to the electric brakes, essentially uh, keeping, uh, you know, avoiding a runaway trailer kind of situation. So this needs to have a third connection point on the receiver, whether that's going to be a quick link or a carabiner, you're going to want this riding right next to those tow chains uh, as opposed to actually you know, like utilizing this or something like that. So three connection points on the receiver and we will be good to go. Jumping right up here to the electric tongue jack here, uh, we have a, a, light, a, a light that gives you a point of reference if you are backing up to the, uh, to the unit at dark time uh, or if you're gonna go ahead and do any coupling or uncoupling after dark, uh, this is a great feature for that. Other than that, you have up or down operation here on the momentary switch. It, it is labeled in terms of direction. Uh, behind this rubber plug here, we have the manual option for that state or for that um, tongue jack, I should say, and uh, that's designed for if you have a power loss situation, uh, you can still safely load and unload the camper. Uh, you're not going to be stranded or anything like that. You'll find a crank handle on the interior of the unit, and that is specifically designed to help uh, crank this up or down again in the event of an emergency. Directly behind that, we have a 20 pound propane cylinder. Now this cylinder is gonna be full for you today. Uh, it does have an open and closed service valve on the top. It is held to the unit with a tension band and wing nuts. I do find that most of my customers have seen these cylinders before, somewhat familiar with them. Same variant you're going to find on a gas grill. And it is totally up to you on whether you keep this cylinder with the unit or you take advantage of an exchange program. Uh, this is of course covered with the propane uh, cover here that's going to not only keep the weather off the tank, but also protect it from damage when uh, going down the road. Now that does slip over this tank. Uh, orientation is actually going to be like that with this uh, locking mechanism for that access door towards the uh, unit itself. You'll see a little hole there on the backside. That's how you know you're, you're orient oriented correctly. Um, from there, uh, you're just going to match up that hole with this stud here on the back of the regulator bracket. Of course, put that wing nut on. That's going to keep that uh, tank cover from blowing off uh, when going down the road. Behind that, we have a brand new Interstate D-Cycle battery. 
uh, you know, very, very uh, easy maintenance that this carries. What that's going to entail is two or three times a year, we're gonna go ahead and pull these vent panels up. We're gonna go ahead and refill with distilled water as necessary. So there is a clear marked water level uh, within the, uh, underneath these panels. And it is just our goal to, uh, of course, maintain that water level. Uh, for periods of long-term storage, not a bad idea to go ahead and physically disconnect these uh, battery terminals. This unit does not have a built-in battery disconnect switch. Uh, with any 12-volt system, you're going to run into nominal or phantom draws that will wear on the system. And by disconnecting it, it is our goal to actually stop that from happening or isolate that battery from the system. So whether you uh, add an aftermarket battery disconnect switch or physically disconnect these terminals, you're going to be in good in shape either way. Uh, coming around here to the side of the unit, now we have stabilizer jacks on all four corners of the units. Uh, these are for stabilization, they are not for leveling. So if we're doing any leveling from front to back, that's going to be done with the main tongue jack up front. Leveling from left to right is going to be done with the tires and what's called a leveling kit. Uh, once we are fairly certain of our level and generally within three degrees of being level is uh, okay, we're then going to go ahead and run these jacks down. Um, with the included stabilizer jack crank handle. Now again, this is something that you're going to want to use a light touch. You're gonna to come down, make contact with the pavement. Same on the way up. You really don't need to bear down on anything. Uh, they are gonna stay in better shape longer if you do again uh, use a light touch with those. Right behind that, we have your sewage hose holder. Uh, this is designed, of course, to hold your sewage hose, uh, keep you from having to store that. Uh, within the unit with all your other stuff. It does run the full width of the camper and is, it does have a door on either side uh, and is large enough to pretty much accommodate any size sewage hose that uh, you decide to use. So, uh, nice feature there. Uh, speaking of sewage, we have your black water dump valve here and bayonet style fitting. Um, now the way that Forest River does it here on the R pods is they actually separate their gray water and their black water dump valves. Um, so we'll see one a little further back on the camera, but this one that we first come to is going to be your black water valve. Now black water is anything that comes from the toilet. So what we're dealing with is solid body waste, toilet tissue, things like that. Uh, it is very important that uh, whether or not we are hooked up to full-time septic that we do keep that black water valve in the closed position. We want to use the monitor panel on the inside, uh, inspect that level of full, and only dump as necessary. So it's very important with that black water that we keep that in as wet or flowing condition as we can. And then when it does come to go ahead and dump, we can go ahead and pull that, um, that, that, that blade valve straight towards the front of the camper. There's no twisting, it is just a six inch pull uh, towards the front of the camper. Now you have a bayonet style fitting here, uh, very straightforward to connect either your sewage hose or your uh, cap there. You have four prongs here along the outside of that tube. We're gonna put the keyhole that is on either the sewage hose or the cap in that halfway position. Give it a quarter turn. That's gonna go ahead and lock it on and be ready for use. Again, even when you are hooked up to full-time septic, we're gonna make sure that that black water valve is in the closed position. We're only gonna dump uh, dump as it fills up or before changing locations, whichever comes first. A uh, little further down, we have your cable satellite inlet. This is a standard RG6 cable fitting. This is just a pass-through cable connection to the designated TV area of the camper. Um, what it does is it just, is, again, ran through the wall, terminates at the television area, allows you to feed either a park cable service or an aftermarket satellite package to the unit. So. Uh, if you, if uh, a campground that you're using uh, offers those services, it will work well for that. We have your 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here. Uh, now this is only going to be plugged into the unit one way, so it will only be accommodated one way. You have an L-shaped receptacle there, and then an L-shaped prong there. If we go ahead and line everything up. We're gonna be good there. You give it an eighth inch turn, that locks it on. And then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down and lock it in further. Now it's my number one recommendation I generally will make with every unit that I deliver, the importance of adding a aftermarket 30 amp surge protector in line here. Uh, you have a lot, of, a lot of sensitive electronics going on here, a lot of, a lot of things going on electronically. 
Uh, and it is our goal to protect those from, from not only surges, but dirty power, substandard wiring, things like that. Uh, now with any surge protector, they install directly at the power source. So you just plug that in line with your cord. And that's gonna go ahead and protect any incoming power to the unit. Uh, if you have any questions on the further importance of a surge protector, uh, or, or you know, need some education on, on what to buy or what to start looking at, feel free to give our parts department a call. They would be more than happy to go ahead and walk you through that process. Uh, while we're here talking about the, uh, while we're here with the tires and lug nuts uh, in front of us, uh, not a bad time to talk about uh, tire pressure and lug nuts. Now these tire, these, these lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot pounds here in the shop. Uh, manufacturer recommends a specific retorque procedure. So what that's going to entail for you is the first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. We want to go ahead and retorque those down or make sure they are maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque. Manufacturer further recommends from the, at the start of each trip there on after that we do go ahead and again make sure they are maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque. Now manufacturer uh, also recommends or, or with any trailer tire you run those at the max tire pressure. Uh, that can be found either on the sidewall of the tire where it is traditionally found or if we take a look here at this data tag you're going to go ahead and find that here. In this case, that's going to be 65 PSI. And again, that's the max tire pressure rating. That's exactly where we want to run them. Now jumping up here to the slide out, uh, good time to talk about slide out maintenance. Uh, this utilizes the Schwintec slide out system. Uh, what that means is you have two independently geared motors uh, pushing this slide in and out. Uh, that means you have tracks top to bottom, left to right. Uh, every 90 days, we're gonna need to lubricate those tracks. What we're going to use is a PTFE dry silicone lubricant. We're going to go ahead and spray those tracks down, run that slide in and out a couple times to distribute that lubricant, and then we're going to be good for the next 90 days. Also on that same maintenance schedule, we are going to want to go ahead and condition these slide out seals. Uh, we're going to use a different product, a, a standard RV grade seal conditioner will do. Keep in mind that these seals do wrap around the, the whole uh, exterior of that slide as well as since the slide does seal in both directions, you have a set of seals on the inside. Again, we're gonna to wanna to make sure we treat those uh, on those 90 day intervals. Uh, jumping over here to the refrigerator compartment, you have a couple vents here on the exterior top and bottom. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about yet is the importance of protecting your propane burning appliances from the intrusion of flying insects, specifically mud divers here in Texas. Uh, mud divers are attracted to the smell of propane, so what happens is they will uh, fly right in here, these, right inside these vents, uh, make their way as deep as they can within the appliance, and build their dirt nest over that flow of propane, generally leaving the appliance inoperable. So what our goal is, is we are going to screen off these uh, openings here with some specifically cut screens that are designed for the appliance. Uh, so again, we're going to protect these, and that not only goes for the refrigerator, but it goes for all of the propane appliances. Um, we'll kind of focus on that, or I'll re-bring re that up when we get to those appliances. Uh, but other than keeping mud daubers and flying insects out of the appliance, not a bad idea to go ahead and remove this vent uh, a couple times a year, stick your head in there, uh, give it a visual inspection, make sure you don't see any frayed wire or any nesting or uh, you know, cracked propane lines, things like that. So just give it an inspection. As long as everything looks good to the eye, uh, you should be in pretty good shape. So from there, uh, removing and installing these vents, you're going to line up the tabs here on the top. That will put you in line with the holes there on the bottom. And it may take some finagling, but once everything is lined up, it should lay flush. Once it does lay flush, we're gonna come here and we're going to uh, give these a quarter turn, that's gonna go ahead and lock them on. Uh, I always go back and do make sure that I have in fact locked it on. Uh, a lot of these get lost there on the open road uh, and all you had to do to avoid it was just come back and check that it is for sure locked on. Uh, outside shower here, access to hot and cold water. Um, you know, from a, from a uh, functionality standpoint, not too terribly much we need to, to discuss. Again, hot and cold water, you have a little uh, holder there for the head. 
Head does have an on off switch to help you conserve hot water or, or water consumption in general. Um, the whole head and hose do store in this compartment. You'll wrap it around the uh, fixture there and it does have a little lock and key there to keep it secure. Uh, we have your suburban furnace here. Now that is going to be a propane burning furnace with 12 volt ignition. Uh, again, not really what we would consider a customer serviceable unit, uh, but it is very important that we do protect it from mud dollars and flying insects. So what we have here is the exhaust for the appliance. Uh, other than again, protecting it from flying insects, things like that. It is very important that we let it breathe. So uh, we want to keep this free flowing. We want to make sure we're not restricting that flow. Uh, it does blow very hot air when it's on. You're not going to want to sit a lawn chair, whatever in front of it. Just make sure it is unobstructed and free breathing. Uh, underneath this wee well here or beside the wheel there, we have your low point drains. Now those are the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. That's how we're going to drain the unit. Uh, all of the in-between plumbing of water. Uh, everything in between water source and fixture is going to be drained for those two lines. Now it is a three point process to purging all the water from the system. Number one is going to be the fresh water tank if it's been in use. Number two is going to be the low point drains there. And lastly we're going to wrap up with draining the water heater separate of the system. We're going to get to that here in just a few minutes but keep that in mind. Uh, coming up here we have your water connections. This one here on top is your potable water fill. That's how we're going to fill that onboard water tank. We're going to go ahead and stick a drinking water hose directly in there. We're going to fill it up to it overflows. Once full, we cap it off. We do need to use that onboard water pump to go ahead and pressurize that system and draw that water up to the fixtures and make it usable. The switch for that water pump is going to be right inside the unit. We'll get eyes on that later so you know where that's at. City water connection, uh, this is of course going to be what you're going to use if you're in the capacity of an RV park or somewhere where you have full time uh, access to running water. We're going to go ahead and use this city water connection. Now city water is pressurized directly from the line. More often than not it is actually over pressurized. So it is very important that we do regulate that pressure. Uh, these units are designed to have a working water pressure of anywhere between 40 and 75 psi. We do include a water pressure regulator with your purchase. That's going to regulate that pressure in between 40 and 50 PSI. If this isn't enough for your liking, feel free to upgrade to either an adjustable water pressure regulator uh, or a high flow water pressure regulator. Keep in mind, we don't want to, do not want to exceed that 75 PSI limit. This is going to hook directly onto the water source. We are then going to hook our spigot side of the hose onto that. And then lastly, the source side of the hose onto the trailer bound connection. And we, ac we accomplish that by rotating that connection there. So very straightforward operation there. Um, you're not going to want to operate the unit for any amount of time without a water pressure regulator. If this gets lost, damaged, stolen, whatever, make sure we're replacing that before taking the unit out. Dropping down low here, we have that, uh, that the gray water side. Uh, in terms of function, it does run just like that black water side. Of course, in this case, we have the cap already removed, so you can kind of see how that connects. We talked about it previously, but you can see you put that in the halfway position, give it an eighth inch turn till it clicks, and you're locked on fully. It's going to be watertight. Orientation of this valve is towards the rear, so to dump that, it is just going to be a six inch pull towards the rear. Um, down low here, underneath this door, we have your fresh water holding tank as well as the drain. So you have a little ho a little fitting there uh, that is just a screw off cap. Now that is again just going to be how we drain that freshwater holding tank. It is a gravity feed system. Just reach under there, uh, go ahead and drain that tank. So hopping up here to the water heater as promised, uh, manufacturer has two very specific recommendations. Number one, that's going to be draining the water heater if it's going to be more in storage for more than seven days. Number two is going to be priming or filling the water heater with six gallons of water before you light it. Um, going through that draining procedure, uh, it's very, very straightforward. Uh, number one, we're going to make sure that it has cooled down to a working temperature. That's at the very least going to take a couple hours. Uh, so once you are fairly confident of the temperature, 
we do need to depressurize it. So before we, de before we depressurize the unit, we need to cut the inflow of water to uh, the unit as a whole. So if that's a city water connection, we're gonna turn that valve off at the fixture. If it's that fresh water connection, we're gonna go ahead and cut that water pump off. Uh, so once we have no new water flowing into the unit, we are then going to uh, depressurize the unit. So we are going to use the hot side of any fixture within the unit to do so. Whether that's the outside shower there, whether that's the uh, kitchen sink, the bathroom sink, either one, we're just going to open up the hot side of any fixture. Once we do so, we're gonna see a little bit of water travel through the line uh, and be displaced, maybe some pressure, things like that coming from that location. Uh, once that water has ceased to flow from that fixture, uh, we are then confident that this has been depressurized. We're gonna come down here with an inch and a sixteenth uh, ratchet and extension generally, and we're gonna go ahead and back that drain plug out. Now from a safety standpoint, it is very important that we do depressurize it. Again, these units are generally under immense pressure. If we fail to do so, it's gonna go ahead, once you go to remove this plug, it's gonna spit it out that way, uh, and hopefully you're not in the way of it when it does so. Uh, so once we've drained the unit, once we, once we go ahead and, and back this drain plug out, we're then gonna have four or five gallons of water uh, being displaced from the unit from this location. Uh, that's how you drain it. Now on the flip side of that conversation, we do need to prime it or uh, pump six gallons of water into the unit before using it. Uh, to do that, it's going to be a, a very similar process to actually depressurizing it, uh, essentially just the exact opposite. So we're gonna introduce a flow of water into the unit. And once we've done so, we are then going to turn again, the hot side of any spigot within the unit on or any fixture within the unit on. Uh, once we do that, we're, gonna, uh, we're going to see that flow be very interrupted, very spitty. Um, you know, what it's doing is it's displacing the air within the tank and refilling it with water. So once that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is going to be our indicator that we do have six gallons of water in the unit. We can safely go ahead and choose our source uh, and heat the water uh, however we'd like. Now. This is a dual source water heater, has a 110 volt heating element, as well as a propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition. Now, when looking at the unit, if we can see this toggle switch down here, now if you didn't know it was there, you may miss it. It is just a on off toggle switch. Now that's how we go ahead and we turn on the 110 volt heating element within the unit. Um, works well, that's going to be kind of your on grid or your RV park option. Uh, biggest problem I have seen with that is people actually forget to turn that toggle switch off before uh, draining the unit or when they are through using the, using, uh, the unit. So try and remember to go ahead and turn that off. Uh, what we're trying to avoid is any dry fire scenarios uh, and ultimately if you drain this with that switch in the on position you're going to 100% have a dry fire situation. Uh, also again runs on, 12, uh, runs on propane with 12 volt uh, direct spark ignition. The switch to turn that on is on the inside of the unit. We're again going to get eyes on that when we do go onto the inside. Uh, last but not least, uh, this is a propane burning appliance. So it is very important that we do protect this from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. You not only have some louvers here, but you have some grating here. And again, we're going to use specifically cut bug screens for the appliance to uh, keep them from nesting uh, uh, within the appliance. Moving on here, uh, storage compartment here, large pass-through storage compartment here, uh, L in shape, so you have a slightly bigger uh, door on the other side and a little bit more space. Uh, coming around here to the rear, nothing too, too crazy. We have your stabilizer jacks down low, leading up there to your tail lights, license plate bracket, things like that. Full-size spare on the rear of the unit. Uh, good point, good, good point to talk about changing a tire. Now, um, these units, when, jacking, when, when changing a tire, uh, it's very important that we, we place the jack in the right location. So for these, these specific units, that's going to be directly on the axle. Uh, we're going to place that jack directly on the axle as close to the tire as we can without it interfering in our work. We're then going to, of course, change the tire safely 
and jack it back down and we're gonna be good to go. Now, one thing I encourage you to, to check before uh, being in that situation or that scenario is since this unit does not have its own lug wrench or jack, make sure that those products that, that are those, those, those things that are uh, with your tow vehicle, your lug wrench and your jack are going to accommodate this unit and allow you to actually change the tire. So just check with that. Uh, coming around here uh, to the other side, we see the, the other side of your storage compartment here. Again, a little bit larger, uh, does give you more access. These storage compartments are accessible from underneath the bed. Uh, might be a slight pain to go ahead and lift the mattress and remove those boards, but they are technically accessible from the inside. Couple 110 volt all weather outlets here, nothing too crazy with that. Um, just again, access to electricity here out in the front porch location. Uh, here we have a black tank flush. Now this black tank flush corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank. It's specifically designed to help blast off compounded waste, toilet waste, uh, toilet paper, things like that. Uh, does work very well, but you do have to use caution when uh, utilizing it. Reason being is because there is no check valve. Uh, if you were to inadvertently overflow that tank, that path of least resistance is the rooftop septic vents. So, so make sure, make double sure that you know how much water you have pumped into that tank. You can do so by either monitoring the panel in the inside uh, for level of full, periodically checking how full that tank is uh, before ultimately running over to the other side and relieving that pressure at the black water valve. Uh, if you, you know, let water rush in here three or four minutes, you should be good. But again, inspect that panel on the inside, making sure you are not overflowing that tank. It is something you will live to regret if you do so. Um, awning, speakers, porch light, things like that. We're going to get to the operation of those there on the inside. It is a power awning. Of course, you have the LED light strip, uh, LED porch light, speakers. We're going to get to all that soon enough. Uh, out here, you have your uh, assist handle. Uh, this does lock in the out position. If we go ahead and lift it up, that's going to allow us to fold it against the body. Some people like to fold it against the door when they're going down the road. Uh, whichever works for you, uh, you will soon find out what you like or what you prefer. Uh, steps, they fold up and in. So again, nothing too crazy. We're out of the realm there. Uh, out and down. Very, very easy to do. Uh, thing I, I enjoy about these units is going to be the uh, outside kitchen. Uh, now, this... Um, this has a sprayer port here for the sink. That's gonna utilize a quick disconnect coupler there. You have a locking collar. You can slide that locking collar back, insert the mail in fully. Once you are fully seated, that hose is gonna automatically pressurize. You can go ahead and use that in conjunction here with the sink. Uh, it's going to help you again, uh, if you're, you're prepping a meal or anything out here. We also have a, a cooktop here, and this is going to utilize a series of quick connects uh, as well. Uh, on the inside of the unit, we're going to find the hose that is accommodated with this. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to use this location here. And we're going to again have a quick connect fitting here. Uh, we would then slide the locking collar back, insert the mail in fully. Once we are fully inserted, we can go ahead and um, put that valve into the on position. We're then going to come to the underside here of the grill and we'll see the male version of a quick connect fitting. We're just going to do the very same thing there. And once we are fully connected, we can then come up here. And this is a very basic kind of camp stove. Uh, to light it, we're gonna need, of course, a long stem barbecue lighter. We're gonna go ahead and turn this to light uh, with both of those valves in that on position, that propane's gonna be flowing. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna put our flame as close to that burner as we can to go ahead and light it and it's gonna work well. Uh, you have the wind guards, things like that to, to prepare a meal out here. Um, I think we've just about covered it here on the exterior of the unit. We're gonna go ahead and hop on the inside and start taking a look at those features. So right here inside the door, we have your fuse panel breaker box and converter uh, all in one unit here. So everything there on the right is going to be a automotive uh, blade style replaceable fuse. 
Uh, not a bad idea to pick up a variety pack of fuses, keep them with the unit. In the event that one were to burn out, uh, you'll of course want a replacement. Labeled there in terms of 12 volt function uh, as well. Everything here on the left side is gonna be a 110 volt appliance. Uh, again, those are labeled in terms of function right there on the lid. And these are resettable uh, breakers, very much what you're going to find in your fuse panel box at home. Uh, they are resettable. Uh, right over here, we have your fire extinguisher. This is part of your safety equipment. Now, it is very important that we do go ahead and we test each piece of our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. Uh, in this case, to test the uh, fire extinguisher, we go ahead and we push that green tap down. If it springs back, that means we have life in it. If not, it's time to go ahead and pull out and replace. So coming here into the unit, uh, we have your television set. Of course, if we were uh, going down the road, this is going to be buckled in uh, with that seatbelt there. Uh, from there, uh, that table is, or that, that TV is on a swivel. We could go ahead and swivel that into the, uh, the bedroom area if we were inclined to do so. Uh, once that's moved out of the way, that's going to expose a couple USB chargers here. Now these are 12 volt chargers. Uh, if you're doing any off-grid camping, you can go ahead and utilize, utilize those to charge any devices. Uh, of course, it's a 110 volt television here. So we have a, a GFI protected outlet there. And then we have your antenna booster uh, up top there. Now this is gonna be the transition of those, that cable and satellite inlet that we saw there on the outside. Uh, you have a single inlet, that's gonna be this top one. And then this one here is going to correspond with an omnidirectional digital over the air television uh, antenna that is on the roof. Uh, what that does or the operation of that is of course you wanna make sure that this red light is on that turns the antenna on. We are then just gonna very, go, very easily go through the prompts on the television set uh, to do a channel search that's going to uh, automatically search out the best signal available and it's gonna go ahead and bring in uh, programming uh, dependent on that signal. So it's a really cool feature. Even, you know, these antennas, they've come a long way over the years. Uh, I would expect to be just about anywhere uh, and be able to still pull in some sort of programming. And then of course, when not in use, we go ahead and buckle it back in. Uh, jumping up here, uh, we have your main switch cluster here. Uh, starting with the awning, we have a momentary switch here to extend and retract that awning. Uh, generally, the door does need to be closed, so you're going to have better luck with that door closed. Uh, just barely rides on the top of it, so uh, not something I would really make a habit of doing. Uh, but again, extend and retract there with the awning. It is an electric awning, uh, very easy to do so legs for that awning to support it are uh, wrapped up right there into the uh, into the cover or if you will whatever you want to call it but they are uh, right there um, slide room in and out switch is right beside that now we talked about the the unit utilizing the Schwintech system now it is very important uh, with any Schwintech system that we do uh, avoid short burst or partial openings. We want to run that slide fully in, fully out. Uh, what happens is because we have two independently geared motors working to pull that in and out, that if we kind of do short bursts or uh, partial openings, believe it or not, it can actually bind it in its opening and then it's not going to come in or out with the motor. So it is very important that we go fully in, fully out. Uh, the system does have an electric brake. So what that means is once we have brought it in or out once we are at that uh, you know extended or retracted position uh, it's going to automatically stop that is your indicator that you can go ahead and take your finger off the switch uh, next up we have our awning lights it is on a it is on a uh, lighted switch uh, in the event that it actually accidentally gets turned on um, doors closed you may not realize it you don't want it wearing on your battery if you're doing any boondocking or anything like that um, so you can go ahead and, and just visually see that they are on. Uh, porch lights, that's gonna be that amber colored light we saw there on the outside, again, easy on off. Interior lights are going to be the last one. Now these interior lights, they have switches directly on the fixture, so you can choose which ones come on and off with that switch. So it is really customizable. Uh, it is nice to have a switch right here within the, uh, right on the inside of the door uh, common switch to allow you to hit those lights, especially if it's, it's dark time. Now, 
all our pods now come pre-wired for solar. Uh, the reason why you see this sticker here is this would be the location of where to mount your charge controller. On the roof, they have the, the wiring terminations up there as well, so you can easily add a panel. All of the hard work has essentially been done, so it is very easy to uh, upgrade. And the reason why you have to put your charge controller here is just where those rooftop wires are transitioning. Uh, beside that, we have your courtesy panel, convenience center, micro monitor, goes by many, many, many different names, but they all do the same thing. And what they do is they let you know how full your battery and holding tanks are. So when looking at this, the more light you see, the fuller whatever we're testing is. So battery in this case reads full. Now battery is going to read full anytime you are plugged into shore power. Uh, the converter is putting 13 plus volts to the battery. Again, giving you the illusion that it is full. To get a true readout of where your battery sits, we do need to unplug from the wall and then come in here and go ahead and test. Now fresh water is going to be full. That's how we've tested the unit, ran through the appliances, is going to be with that fresh water. And then we have black water that's going to be uh, empty, of course, as it should be. Gray water is empty as it should be. So very easy to navigate around that panel. We then have your water pump switch here. Again, that's how we're utilizing the unit or we're testing things out is via the water pump system. Uh, that's what we're going to use to draw that fresh water up from that holding tank again and make it usable at the fixtures. And then here we have the propane side of your water heater. Uh, as I explained on the outside, they do uh, separate those switches. And what we see here is going to be that propane side with that 12 volt direct spark ignition. Uh, so the water heater is up to temperature. It's not going to do much for us here. But uh, if we were initially lighting this, this fault light would come on with that water heater. Now that fault light is essentially our indicator on whether or not the water heater has lit. So while it's going through its lighting cycle, you may see that light come on and off multiple times. The lighting cycle is generally three times. If the water heater does not light by the end of that third cycle, that fault light's gonna stay on and it is just indicating to you that the water heater has failed to light. Uh, reason being generally, you know, a multitude of different reasons, but generally uh, either your propane valve is closed, either you are out of propane gas, or oftentimes it just is not, the gas has just not made its way through the line to the appliance. Uh, in the event that that happens, just hop on outside, make sure you have your valve in the on position, make sure you actually have uh, gas in the tank, and then come in here, turn that switch off, turn it back on. Uh, as long as you've corrected the issue, it's going to generally light on that first try of that second cycle. Uh, up top here, we have your Furon uh, stereo system there. Uh, now this is going to give you um, access to not only AM, FM radio, but Bluetooth. You also have multiple inlets in, so you have 3.5 millimeter jack in, you have HDMI in, and you have USB in. Now this does communicate with the television via HDMI arc, so you can actually put your streaming services here and they will feed it to the television. Uh, or if you have a USB uh, drive with some music on it or something, you can do so. Uh, of course, headphones and 3.5 millimeter uh, headphone jack in, we know how that works, uh, and Bluetooth connectability. So I find most people, especially with a, a basic kind of stereo system like this, can, can really work themselves through it. Uh, but there is going to be its own service manual uh, to help explain things further. Uh, again, should be fairly easy to work around. Uh, beside that, we have your switches for your speakers. Your options are inside and outside. You have speakers both on the inside and the outside, uh, or both at the same time. So that is clearly marked. Uh, it is, again, very easy to navigate through those options. Uh, coming here into the dinette. Now, this dinette does make a secondary sleeping area. Uh, it utilizes the table to do so. Uh, the table is very easy to uh, lower or raise. Um, to do so, we would, of course, unlock it from this position here. So once we've slid that, that yellow uh, keeper or lock in the back position, it's actually going to come this way and down. So I always kind of like to, to, pour it, to, to pull it out into this area as much as I can. And it is also going to be easier if you kind of put your foot on it because the springs are very tough uh, and it can kind of just slip around there on the floor. So once we come down, and I'll move it out a little bit more, uh, the idea would then to be take this tabletop, lift it up or slide it in. And we want that to be resting on these black bumpers. Now with that table resting on the black bumpers, we're then going to take these two side cushions. 
Uh, we're going to place them over the tabletop to fill out this sleeping area, and it is a very easy, um, very easy secondary sleeping area. Uh, you know, it's a lot easier than like a pedestal style um, dinette table, things like that. So it is very user friendly. And then when we go ahead and, and lift it back up into the table mode, uh, it does, doesn't lock in the down position, so we don't have to worry about that yellow tab. But again, you may want to kind of put your foot uh, on the underside or on the leg or something. And then we're just going to come up. And this thing likes to, to give you some problems here. So if we, again, put our foot down there and spring it up there, again, it just takes a fair amount of effort. And if your angle is off like mine, uh, it can give you some problems. Now they do have some buckles here on the, the, the floor to secure this table. Uh, I've never seen these tables really move around much when going down the road, but of course make yourself comfortable. If you want to buckle it in, uh, go right ahead. Uh, it's not going to hurt anything, of course, if you buckle it in. Uh, right here we have your main GFI outlet. Now all the receptacles in this unit are on the same circuit. Uh, they all are controlled by this reset button on the GFI outlet. So if you uh, have reliability issues with your outlets, one of them's not working, chances are they are all not working. Uh, and just remember this would be that reset point functions very much like the GFI receptacle inside uh, most households' bathrooms. So keep that in mind. Uh, coming up here to your high point three-way uh, convection microwave grill. Uh, this works extremely well. Uh, you know, it, it, it's very easy to use on the inside there. Uh, we have a, 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 uh, a, a heating element on the top. You can operate it like a toaster oven, uh, of course, like a convection oven, and uh, a standard run-of-the-mill microwave. And in terms of function, uh, it is very indicative of what you're going to see with the microwave. You, of course, have your sources here up on top, uh, time and temperatures down here, so you will preheat it depending on your mode. Uh, you have some, some default uh, cook times for different foods. But again, it does have its own service manual. If you have any questions, uh, we can go ahead and, and walk you through that or, or consult the, uh, uh, the, the user manual. Uh, below that, we have your Dometic three-way refrigerator here. Uh, very easy, again, to navigate through this. On-off switches all the way to the left. If we go ahead and turn that on... Um, it's going to default to the last chosen source, which for us in this case was propane. Uh, but to select a different source, we just push the picture. Uh, of course, your plug, that means the 110 volt AC, elect 110 volt AC. And then the flame means propane. The battery means 12 volt. Uh, now, just a word of caution, these units in general, these ammonia absorption systems are pretty... Uh, inefficient and very power hungry on that 12 volt side of things. Uh, it's our opinion as a dealership to uh, make sure you are very well educated on, on the operation of these and, and the run times and things before using it on 12 volt. Uh, I have heard of it leaving people stranded uh, and a lot of our customers are just not overall pleased with the, uh, the ability of it to, to, uh, to cool food uh, on that 12 volt side of things. So just keep that in mind, educate yourself, uh, use that, use caution again on that 12 volt side. Propane and electricity, they work, they work excellent. Uh, shouldn't have any problems with them. Um, propane is going to be your boondocking or going down the road option. Uh, of course, AC is going to be your, uh, hundred, your, your RV park option. Uh, if you were to go and try and light it, say on gas, and you didn't have any propane or it hadn't lit yet, uh, it's going to start alarming to you. It's going to start beeping at you audibly uh, as well as, as you know, you'll see the lights blink. If you go ahead and you push that button there, that's going to acknowledge, uh, you know, that, that it didn't light or that there is an issue. And then it's going to automatically start trying to correct that issue. So if it hasn't lit uh, on propane, then it is going to recycle and start trying to light again. So here on the inside of the fridge, um, you know, very typical of what you would see with like a dorm style fridge. You do have the uh, foldable ice box there. This is removable. If you go ahead and follow these directions here on the sticker, 
Uh, you have the cool blue lights. What you have here is going to be a door hold open. So if we go ahead and push in and out, that's going to allow that to come out. Uh, what that's going to do is that's going to keep the door from closing all the way. Uh, what you'll want to do uh, when you would use that is if you're storing the unit when it's not on uh, to keep that door cracked, uh, keep it from getting stinky or mildewy there on the inside. And to go ahead and put it back in, we push firmly. And again, this can, can give you some problems here, but you push firmly uh, and go ahead and put it back in. Again, you got to push, you know, kind of hard uh, and it can be hard, you know, you got to push firm and it can be hard to do so uh, before sliding it back. Uh, over here, we have your camping stove. This is the exact same camping stove we saw there on the outside, uh, although it is hard lined or plumbed within the unit. Uh, so there is no quick connect or anything like that. But in terms of operation, it's going to be the very same. Uh, we have a long stem barbecue lighter. We're going to go ahead and turn it to light. Uh, we're going to hold our flame directly on the burner until it, of course, lights. Now, the difference on here is you have this nice tempered glass countertop extender. Uh, very important that we do let these cool down before we go ahead and shut this. And it goes without saying, saying that this is not a cooktop, this is not a griddle. Uh, make sure you are letting that burner uh, cool down before closing the lid here. Uh, also here in the kitchen area, of course, we have your sink uh, with the, uh, you know, this uh, plastic uh, sink cover, things like that. You're going to have standard run of the mill uh, mini blinds here in the kitchen because of the proximity to the stove. Uh, they don't want you to have the pull down shades, which we haven't even seen yet, but we'll go ahead and uh, demo those here in just a second when we get to the bedroom. All right, guys, so let me show you the other parts of winterizing other than bypassing your water heater. Underneath your cooktop in the cabinet in the bottom, I've removed this panel. It's just held in with a couple of screws at the bottom and pulled it out. And then all the way in the back, you'll find your water pump all the way back here. The biggest thing we're worried about is going to be this valve uh, that's right there. If I can get my finger out of the way. It's going to be a valve that basically is going to change the water flow direction to this hose that we want right here. So what this allows us to do is to uh, change the sucking direction of that pump to this hose. And we can take this hose, put it into our gallon of antifreeze solution and suck it directly through this hose into our faucet fixture uh, our bathroom, our toilet, our outside shower, all that good stuff. And then you're done. It's a very simple process instead of having to pour it all into the tank and use more than you need. Uh, so you would bypass the water, he uh, water heater, come back over here, turn that valve, put this into your jug of uh, antifreeze, turn the water pump on and run all your faucets and fixtures, everything until they flow pink and you're done with winterizing. Uh, very simple process. If I go ahead and turn around, uh, we have uh, up top here, we have your thermostat. Now this is a captive touch thermostat. It's a touch button or touch screen. Uh, and I've heard complaints that this just is not as responsive as, as a lot of people would like. Um, just be patient with it. I promise you, if you push harder on the button or the screen, that's not gonna help you out uh, in the long run. Uh, just use a light touch. And this is gonna be your single mode button. And this is gonna be your temperature control up or down. Now, when I hit that mode button from that off uh, setting, it's going to kick me into a, it's going to force me into choosing a, fair, a fan speed, and this is air conditioner fan speed. Now, if I go to either low or high, that air conditioner fan is going to run indefinitely whether or not it has hit that set thermostat temperature or not. Also, if I go to either low or high, that fan is going to continue to run even if ultimately my next selection were to be furnace. So to keep it um, right with you, Keep it in auto, that's gonna be the best, the best feature anyway, the best mode. So I confirm that I want it in auto, and then it takes me right there into that air conditioner setting. Uh, what it's saying here is that we are uh, in that air conditioner mode. Our fan speed is auto, like we set, and the thermostat is set at 70 degrees. Once it reaches 70 degrees within a unit, that whole unit's gonna go ahead and shut down uh, until it hits 71 degrees where it's gonna kick back on. If I hit it one more time, it's going to take us into the furnace mode. Once it kind of catches up with the selections that I've made, it's going to power down the air conditioner and blower motor. It's going to kick on the furnace blower motor, which is located underneath the bed. Uh, you know, 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. In a unit of this size, I would not be surprised if it set off the smoke alarm during that first 15 minutes of operation. Uh, Suburban, the manufacturer of the furnace, 
says that that is well within spec. It does not burn as efficient as it should within that first 15 minutes of operation, but as it burns, that efficiency rating is going to go up and it should stop setting off the smoke alarm. So if that happens, don't be alarmed. Of course, don't take the battery out. Um, you know, just, just, just deal with it, silence it. And again, within the first 15 minutes of operation, uh, it would almost be expected. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it off. The only other feature on that or next selection is going to be off. We're going to turn that off. That blower motor is going to blow off the excess heat from, with, from within the appliance. Uh, so it may continue to run for, you know, two minutes or so after you've turned it off here. Uh, down low here on the floor, we have a secondary, um, or we have your second piece of safety equipment. Now this is a carbon monoxide LP leak detector. It does have a test button on there. Our bathroom here. Just coming in is going to be our light switch. It's going to run the light on and off. There's also a, a button on the light itself up here that you can use. So if for some reason the switch isn't working, make sure that's turned on. Also, while we're up here, we do have a uh, vent fan. You just crank it up. And then it's going to be a uh, four speed setting. All you got to do is cycle through the button presses to get the higher speeds. Um, up to 900 CFM on this fan, so it works pretty good. Then you can just push the off button if you just want to turn the whole thing off, and then you can crank it back down. Once you get it all the way down, push that knob up, and that's going to kind of lock it in place for travel. For your shower, got hot and cold mixing here. Uh, you do have a diverter for the uh, shower head, so you can just put water into the little sink here, or you pull up the diverter, that's going to run it up to the shower head, which has a flow control lever on it right here. Uh, one way is going to allow water to flow out, the other way is going to drop it down to a trickle. Since you only have, you know, roughly six gallons of hot water in this trailer, you want to conserve. And last thing is the uh, toilet over here. It's going to be um, hand flush. So halfway is going to put just water into the bowl. And if you pull it all the way, the valve is going to open, the blade valve is going to open, and everything in the toilet is going to go down into the black tank. That pretty much covers your toilet. Just remember to be using uh, toilet, toilet treatment to control waste digestion and odors. If I have missed something, don't hesitate to give us a call. And again, this is Cody with Princess Craft RV.